why study these pagan authors? At the root of this, this is all common grace. We do this because we believe that God bestowed grace even on those who didn't know him in a saving way. Mm. Of course, the New Testament bears witness to all of this. You know, Romans 1, there's a few passages in Acts where even those who have no special revelation, they've not, you know, heard the, the word of God. They still know God. Like Romans 1, the, the condemnation isn't they didn't know God. It's that they knew him, but they didn't worship him and honor him as God. Welcome to Scalay Sisters the podcast for classical homeschooling mamas who yearn for something more than just checking boxes and getting it all done. Scalay Sisters discusses topics that matter to those of us who believe that educating ourselves through reading widely, thinking deeply, and applying faithfully equips us for the task of educating our children. I'm your host, Brandi Vensel. You can come study Charlotte Mason with me over in the Charlotte Mason Think Tank, Go to afterthoughtsblog.net slash think tank to learn more. My co-host today is Misty Winkler. Misty is a homeschooling mom of five, including two graduates. She writes and podcasts at simplyconvivial.com and is the author of The Convivial Homeschool, now available on Amazon. Our guest today is Brent Pinkall author of the fabulous new book, Redeeming the Six Arts, A Christian Approach to Chinese Classical Education, which I cannot recommend enough. Brent Pinkall is a lecturer of rhetoric at New St. Andrews College. Before joining the faculty at New St. Andrews, Pinkall taught rhetoric at a classical Christian college in China for more than five years. He has also taught at various public universities in China. In addition to rhetoric, Pinkall has taught college-level courses in logic, epistemology, history of classical education, classical pedagogy, astronomy, English, and English literature. He has ministered in China for more than 12 years with a focus on promoting classical Christian education. Are you ready for this year's spring training? Because it's going to be amazing. We're calling it Dead White Guys because the latest attack on classical education seems to be the claim that classical education should be discarded because much of the source material was written by white men. We've hired Monique Dusson and Krista Bontrager from the Center for Biblical Unity to fit us for conversing on these issues. Session one is all about critical theory, and session two is basically a defense of classical education against the attacks of critical theory proponents. Each session ends with a live Q&A. It's going to be so great. For more information, go to scolaysisters.info slash CRT. That's scolaysisters.info slash CRT. Today, you get to listen in on the fascinating conversation Misty and I got to have with Brent Pinkall on Chinese classical education. Does an education have to be Western in order to be classical? Pinkall says no, that the Chinese should honor their own philosophical fathers rather than ours. You are going to love this discussion. And so without further ado, let's get to it. Let's start off with our school day every day. Misty, why don't you go first and show us how we do it? All right. Well, I am reading a book that's been on my shelf for, I'm sure it's over a decade now, <laughs> but I pulled it off. It's when you know, right right now we're living in a rental. We moved about a year ago and very few books are unpacked in our Mm. rental. I have boxes and boxes of books that are packed, but I had a friend, well, it's Renee Shepard, who's been on the podcast. Mm -hmm. I was texting with her and she said, I've been reading this book called How to Read Slowly by James Sire. Have you read it? And I said, well, I haven't read it. I've owned it for a very long time. And actually it's on my shelf here at the rental. So it earned a spot to be unpacked. My second son is starting, did start this last fall at New St. Andrews. And so I thought, well, maybe this is a book he might need or he Mm. might want it. So it, it got special treatment here. And of course he said, I don't need to read slowly. I need to read quickly. Yeah, for real. (laughs) (laughs) So since she mentioned it, I picked it up and started reading it and it's very good. I suppose it's in a way 
similar to how to read a book by Mortimer Adler, but it's, I don't know, like a quarter of the size. <laughs> so you can read it slowly <laughs> and still get that in a reasonable amount of time. <clears throat> And so he talks about how to read worldviewishly, which is a phrase I've heard other people use that term. I guess it comes from this book, how to read worldviewishly. So the questions to ask and how to see in the text, the presuppositions of the author. Hmm. And he has a chapter on reading poetry, a chapter on reading fiction and nonfiction. And he actually has a little bit that you read, and then he kind of walks you through what it's like to read it worldviewishly. Hmm. So anyway, it's been very good. I've only read the first couple chapters and not the ones on specific genres. And then I went and read the last chapter, which is knowing what to read and when. (laughs) Hmm. But they're very short chapters. He says here in the last chapter, in a section called Reading with a Purpose, If we have the idea that somehow, someday, we will catch up on the reading we have wanted to do, we had best forget it. When we finish the book we've wanted to get to, we will almost certainly be prompted to read five more that have been suggested by it. We will never catch up, but we can get on with it. (laughs) So I thought that was, that was great. It's been a fun book. I just don't see how someone who promotes reading slowly could say these things. So discouraging. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I have to tell you, Misty, I've had that book sitting on my desk, half read for like four (laughs) four years. Oh, get on with it. He says, I know I'm not, I guess I didn't make it to that part. No, I actually do kind of remember that quote. Ah, well, um, Brent, you want to share what you are reading these days? Sure. Yes. So I'm uh, almost finished with a book by a woman named a scholar named Mary Caruthers. Hmm. The book is called The Book of Memory. And it's uh, uh, so I'm a I'm a rhetoric teacher at uh, at New St. Andrews College. And uh, one of the five sometimes called canons of, of rhetoric is memory. And I'm especially interested in memory. And this, this book is kind of the, it's a foundational text in this memory scholarship, if you will. Mm. And uh, in the book, Caruthers, uh, it's, it's kind of a, in some sense, it's a historical survey of how mnemonics developed over time, but she dives into some specific, well, it's, it's all rooted in what the ancients call the method of Loki. Uh, and it's uh, literally the, the, the method of places and Loki, uh, basically this method, this mnemonic uh, method entails creating images in your mind and placing, sometimes you'll hear memory palace. It's the same, mm-hmm. same, the same thing. Uh, you have this image in your mind first of a place it could be your home it could be a fictional place but just suppose you have this image in your mind of your home and then you create images of the things you want to remember and you place them in different parts of your home and then whenever you want to remember those things you in your mind you walk through your home and you see those images and they remind you of the things so this is the basic sort of uh, mechanics of the of the method and Caruthers traces the influence of this method through time. And uh, she was responsible for finding it, if you will, finding it in places that scholars before her didn't really see it. And it really helps to understand, especially medieval culture, hmm. you know, where you see these strange things in medieval culture and you, they're, you're scratching your head. So just one example that she talks about that really changed my view of, of things was um, illuminated Bible manuscripts. So we think of illuminated Bibles as just, you know, fancy decorations in the Bible to make it look pretty. Mm -hmm. Um, But the illuminated Bibles arose out of mnemonic principles. So the, the reason that they started, that they started doing this was to remember the scriptures better. And so they created these images on the page so that you could remember the text better. And one of the things that causes you to scratch your head, if you, if you, I don't know if you've ever 
looked into medieval Bible manuscripts, but frequently you'll find strange illustrations of like animals doing weird things, like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like two bunny rabbits sword, you know, fighting with swords. And like, what does that have to do with, you know, this passage on, you know, the incarnation or whatever? Like, it's, it seems ridiculous. You know, did some like student just scribble in there just, you know, for, for fun? Bored monks. I always thought it was bored monks. Yeah, bored monks. <laughs> yeah, see, and and uh, in fact, they had reasons for what they were doing. And uh, and it comes out in all, you know, in, in medieval art and literature and all these interesting ways that just aren't intelligible if you don't understand the underlying mm-hmm. method of Loki that informs all of that. So I have found that very exciting and interesting. And it spurred me on. Actually, I've been experimenting with creating my own illuminated Bible uh, oh, fun. experimenting with some of these things. So yeah, that's my, that's my book. It makes sense to me that it would help with memory. Cause I'm thinking about how I can't ever remember anything in a digital book because the physical nature of the book helps me remember where I was in the book. And I think yes. about where I saw it on the page. Yes. Uh huh. It's exactly right. So I could see how something more vivid would help enhance memory. Yes. And it's, it's unfortunate too. Like I've been thinking, you know, in our day, we only find pictures in children's books usually mm-hmm. because they just, they feel childish. Uh, whereas in medieval times, they were in adult books. <laughs> and, awesome. uh, and it makes you wonder, yeah, if, what if we added, you know, all these illustrations and pictures to, you know, the books, The Abolition of Man, for example, mm-hmm. uh, you know, h- how much more would it stick with the ideas and things stick if yeah. they were, you know, accompanying pictures? Interesting. Well, um, I feel like you guys have really nice books. <laughs> I, on the other hand, I'm actually pre-reading a book to decide whether or not I'm going to add it to my economics curriculum for my students. It was recommended, actually, Misty, someone brought it up in the sistership. Someone was asking for book recommendations for economics, wealth management, that kind of thing. And they said, the richest man in Babylon. And what I thought was interesting was that it was told as fiction even though it's supposed to be giving kind of like personal money management type advice, which (laughs) by far my favorite economics book is Jane Marset's John Hopkins notions on political economy, which is basically like economic free market fairy tales from like, I think she's in the 1800s. She might even be in the 1700s. So, so she basically took wealth of nations or something and turned it into fairy tales. (laughs) And it's it's amazing. (laughs) And I'm kind of fascinated with people who can take more abstract concepts and turn them into stories. So this one is more like personal wealth management. I'd say Marset is more free market principles is really what she's getting at. This is more, how do I individually handle money better than I do? And so you have this situation with the King of Babylon who has decided that the wealthiest city is basically because it has the greatest quantity of wealthy, like wealthy individuals. So he doesn't want just one person to be the richest man in the world and live there. He wants all of his people to be prosperous. Then you have people that are kind of the bottom of the barrel who are complaining and basically they have a victim mentality. So things like, well, I could never because I don't earn enough money or have enough opportunity or my wife spends all my money or I mean, there's just (laughs) all these different excuses that they're giving. And so he has this rich man come in and give them personal wealth management sorts of advice, but the whole thing is done as a story with a man explaining things to younger men who haven't yet been successful. Anyway, it's, it's very, it's very interesting. If I end up using it though, I'm really going to have to combat some things because with Marset, it's very, um, you're just not running into some of the materialism type. She's really just trying to teach basic economics with this. There's this kind of assumption that like, maybe your life goal could be chasing wealth. Hmm. maybe the love of money is like a good thing. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm trying to figure out, is it the kind of thing I can get past? Because the advice I would say is very good. And I love the way the guy goes about combating, not just the victim mentality, but also dealing with failure. And just, you know, if you make an investment and it goes bad, I mean, he's basically like, well, you get back up and you do it again. You don't like not invest for the rest of your life or something. But anyway, i I was raised by, my dad was an options trader. And so he was just like, he managed wealth. That's what he did. 
And I feel like as a little kid, you know, he would tell me things about, I don't know, compound interest, for example. And I would really try to be in it because I re- into it because I really loved my dad. But I just remember being like, I am not sure why we're talking about this. <laughs> and I'm having trouble caring. <laughs> <laughs> as, as I'm reading this book, because it's in stories, I actually see a lot of his best advice in it, but it's told in a way that, you know, like a junior high or early high school kind of mind can easily wrap around it. Basically, he says things like, you don't just save some of your money, you use some of your money to invest in something. In this case, they're like giving it to merchants or something like that. But I felt like because he talked about these little gold coins, that was so much more vivid in my mind than compound interest, (laughs) which was really (laughs) hard to visualize as a little kid. Anyway, it's very interesting. I read one part of it to some of my older teenagers. And so we had the discussion about how Christians might define the word investment differently. Dividends might be paid in non-monetary ways when you're investing, you know, like the typical, like investing in the kingdom thing. We talked about things like when you send money to a missionary, could you see that as an investment? It's not the kind of thing you're going to get back. Anyway, so we've been having some interesting discussions and I, I still haven't made a final decision because I feel like it could be a dangerous book if the ideas are accepted in the wrong way. Mm-hmm. But um, it's been a fun read. I just, like I said, I'm fascinated by people who can take abstract things and put feet on them in this way. So it's been fun. Interesting. Hello, Abby here to tell you about Sistership the place for moms learning and growing. We embrace the call to shape culture by starting with our own education, our own library shelves, and thinking and planning how to spend our time. We need to be equipped for the great task of educating our children. Sistership is the place to talk about reading widely, a place to discuss and think deeply, and share how you are faithfully applying the ideas you encounter. Sistership is for all the women serious about education for themselves and for their families. But understand that in order to educate, we can't take ourselves too seriously. Join us in Sistership for the camaraderie and stay for the fun. Really, this conversation is coming about because Misty and I have both been reading your book, Redeeming the Six Arts, A Christian Approach to Chinese Chinese Classical Education. It is so good. I already said this earlier, but I want to make sure it's in the recording. (laughs) <laughs> we're going to talk about some things, but I'm like, everybody who's listening to this really needs to go buy your book. Thank so, you. <laughs> um, so we have, a, I actually have a whole bunch of questions written down. I don't know <laughs> if we'll have time to get to all of them, but we're going to try it. But the first thing I want to talk about is your application of the fifth commandment for our listeners who don't have the commandments memorized in order. <laughs> this is the one that says honor your father and your mother. And um, your application of this commandment to education isn't new. I think I've heard it more um, in regard to things like patriotism than I have directly the way that you use it. Mm -hmm. But I also think that, I mean, I know this is the case of me. If you're, if you are of myself, I think I'm getting my grammar wrong here, but we're going to go with it. Um, (laughs) I really, I think that those of us who were raised in kind of like modern, big evangelicalism have never heard this before. I mean, I didn't hear this until I was an adult studying reformed theology. So Can you explain to our listeners how you are using the fifth commandment here? And because really, I think this matters. It doesn't just matter to the Chinese. It matters to everyone who educates. Right. Yeah. So the, so we tend to isolate that commandment to, you know, do what your biological parents tell you to do, uh, you know, your mom and dad and, and just kind of stop there. And traditionally the reformers and not just reformers, I mean, this goes back long, long before them, mm-hmm. uh, understood father and mother to refer to very broadly, just those in authority over us. So it would include, yes, the king, he was, he's a kind of, a kind of father. So there, you know, there's, there's, there is the patriotism sort of honor the emperor kind of fits into that category, but it also entails, you know, in, in Hebrew, the, the father and mother, those words do not just refer to your immediate mom and dad, but your grandparents, right? So we'd, we'd say, you know, your fathers are just as our fathers, uh, you know, led us through the, the wilderness or whatever. So the first thing to to note is the, just the scope of father and mother. It's much 
broader than just your, who, those who gave birth to you. And then also honor, like what is, what does it mean to honor? And uh, it's, again, this is broader than just obey. We can imagine a father and mother who, you know, a, a son, let's imagine a son who he, he, would, he refuses to eat the, mo- the food his mother cooks him and to speak the language that his parents speak and to listen to his father's story. You know, his father wants to tell, hey, when you know, let me tell you a story, son, when I was a kid. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear it, dad. Is it about compound interest? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, and we would all look at that son and say he's not honoring his father and mother. Well, this is what the parents are doing there. They're, they're trying to pass on a culture, a culture of values, of, again, stories, language, food, art. They're passing on this heritage to the son, and it's, and it's our duty to respect and honor that. And so this naturally becomes an important part. I mean, education, education, though, the Old Testament roots education in the father's and mother's teaching the son, mm-hmm. right? And, or the book of Proverbs, you know, hear your, hear my son, your father's instruction. Education is primarily passed on to us through our fathers and mothers. And so the fifth commandment I, I see as a, just a really fundamental proof text, if you will, for, for, <laughs> for education and where we ought to search for wisdom. Uh, it's primarily from our fathers and mothers. And then that, of course, for Christians, you know, there, there's, it raises all kinds of questions. I mean, what if your father and mother aren't Christians <laughs> mm-hmm. and they want to you to do, you know, do things that are, you know, contrary to scripture. And we can, we can talk about some of those things, but uh, you know, the Bible not only tells us to honor our fathers and mothers, it also distinguishes between two kinds of fathers and mothers. We have our spiritual fathers and mothers, if you will. Uh, you know, Jesus says, you know, nobody's left father or mother uh, who has not received, uh, you know, in this life, many fathers and mothers. So, so we've got sort of our earthly fathers and mothers, and then our, these spiritual fathers and mothers. And, and we need to honor both. Uh, and this is another, another important point that connects to, you know, my project in, in China. Um, we can't just say, I'm a Christian now. My father is, you know, my fathers are Augustine and Calvin, you know, and the apostles, and I have no duties anymore to my earthly, you know, heritage. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can't say that. And similarly, we can't just dismiss our spiritual heritage in favor of our earthly heritage. And we need to honor both. And of course, our spiritual heritage um, should take precedence over our, our earthly heritage. We, we find our identity primarily in Christ, but we need to honor both. And so that may, means that, um, you know, our education, our schools, our curriculum should reflect that. And also for this reason, you know, I believe that um, this is why classical Christian education in America can't look identical to classical Christian education in China, because mm. our fathers are different. But... At the same time, uh, we do share in Christ, we do share the same fathers and mothers, spiritual fathers and mothers. And so there's going to be a lot of overlap as well. We both will be reading, you know, Augustine and, and whatnot. So uh, that's sort of laying the groundwork, I guess. I'm not sure where you, where you want to go with that, but that's the sort of foundation of the philosophy underlying that book. You make this really, I would almost call it a polarizing statement. On page 106, which I know you just have your whole book memorized and what page everything's on. <laughs> I have a book with me, though. I <laughs> you say no Chinese classical Christian school can say it is committed to the Christian tradition while simultaneously refusing to learn from the Confucian tradition. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying it's so scary to stand up and say something like that. So you're, I mean, you're definitely drawing a line in the sand here. Have you received pushback from Chinese Christians on this? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, yes, I didn't create the line in the sand here. It was <laughs> long, long created before I, I, I dived <laughs> You inherited this. So, it? <laughs> yeah, before I inherited it. Uh, so I should, I should mention this book was written 
originally for Chinese readers. Okay. And then I and then Roman Rhodes came along and said, you know, I think I think American readers actually can get, gain a lot from this. And so we made a little bit, a few edits, but it's still uh, my original audience was Chinese, and so some of the some of the things I say, you know, they're speaking into a situation that you know we might not be familiar with. So just uh, mm-hmm. to let you know that in the Chinese Christian um, world, there are two. Well, just for simplicity's sake, there are really two main camps. There are the state-approved churches, state-approved Christianity, and so that in in China, there it's only legal, technically legal, to attend these state-approved churches, which they call the Three Self Church. This is the only legal church, if you will, in China. And so. Any other churches that you go to are technically illegal. And the that church really is very nationalistic in nature, and it's controlled by the Communist Party. The Communist Party, especially over the last, last decade or so, has really been imposing sort of traditional Chinese culture on these Christians and mm-hmm. trying to syncretize basically Christianity with traditional Chinese paganism, if you will. Interesting. Uh, and, and it comes out into different degrees. Sometimes it's not as obvious as, uh, you know, in other churches. So if you, you know, as you can imagine, this, the three self church is, the, is kind of sort of the, the liberal half of Chinese Christianity. It's, you know, it's very liberal in lots of different ways. And so, Conservative Christians, um, many conservative Chinese Christians have pushed in the other direction, and so they say, "Well, look, they're uh, so they're these guys over here are, you know, emphasizing traditional Chinese culture. Well, they're clearly not in line with Scripture. I mean, just their theology is all messed up. And so, if we want to be true to Scripture, we must reject that. And of course, there is paganism in the Chinese classical tradition, and so they reject." all of it, you know, Confucianism and all of the culture that comes with it and say, no, we are Christians and we value the Christian tradition. And of course, for them, that means the West, Western tradition. And you have this interesting sort of dynamic where you find classical Christian schools, on the one hand, condemning Confucianism because it's pagan, and on the other hand, teaching Plato and Aristotle because they're supposedly more Christian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ironic. <laughs> yes. And so, um, yes, this is a very divisive issue. And that's why I wrote the book is because mm-hmm. I work in those conservative circles mm-hmm. and I equally oppose the, the what's going on with the three self church and this liberalism. But I, I think a large portion of these brothers and sisters on the other side are overreacting mm-hmm. And I do stand by that statement that they have a duty because of the fifth commandment, they have a duty to learn from. And I'm not, it's not an option, <laughs> just as I don't have an option to listen to my, my father and mother. I have a duty mm-hmm. to listen to my father and mother. And that's why I, I come out so, so strongly. Mm-hmm. But again, that raise, uh, you know, that can be easily be misunderstood as approving of Confucian, you know, all of Confucianism. Or suggesting that Confucianism is just, you know, it's it's on the same level as Christianity. There's ways to misread what I'm saying there. But I do think Chinese Christians ought to be studying the Confucian tradition because that was the tradition of learning passed down to them from their mm. earthly fathers. Western culture kind of has similar <laughs> things happening Absolutely. too. And that's yes, my approach in this book is basically what did the church fathers do? <laughs> what mm-hmm. they did were imitating the church fathers and they engaged with their pagan past and sifted it, found the gold hidden therein and discarded the rest. And that's the same kind of thing I'm exhorting our, you know, our brothers and sisters in China to do. Do you think we have one thing, <laughs> this is probably a dangerous question to ask. Do we have one thing that w- you would maybe make parallel with Confucian tradition? Like, If I said, you know, fill in the blank, no American classical Christian school can say it is committed to the Christian tradition while simultaneously refusing to learn from blank. Like it's basically your statement, but rephrased for Americans. Do you have something that you would fill in the blank there with? 
That's a great question. So first of all, I would say there is no figure in the Western tradition, I would say, as influential as Confucius mm. was to the Chinese, to Chinese culture. I wondered about that because you kept coming back to him in a way that we don't seem to do in our tradition. Right. I mean, you hear you hear phrases like, you know, Plato, what is it? Like all of history, Western history is in footnote to Plato. You know, you, mm-hmm. you hear some, you hear phrases like that. And, and yes, a lot of Platonic ideas that influenced, you know, even how we think of certainly like Augustine, you know, was a, a Platonist and influenced, you know, a lot of the, even the terminology and the way we think about Christian theology. Aristotle had, you know, a lot of influence in that in that regard. But even Confucius's influence is still much broader than, mm. than what we find with Plato and Aristotle. But I would say, I mean, I would say if you're in the West, um, you know, by the time you graduate high school in a classical Christian school, like you should know who Plato is <laughs> <laughs> and you should know some basic ideas that he held. But again, it's hard for us to grasp just how influential somebody like Confucius was uh, on Chinese culture. And that's why I come out specifically with Confucius. Because there are, there are other schools in addition to Confucianism. There's Taoism, there's legalism, there's some other mm. schools of thought in China, Chinese history. But it was primarily because, I mean, there's various causes, but you know, China, China was imperialistic and the emperor imposed the kinds of education that would be taught so the emperor imposed just top down like from the han dynasty on we are a confucian culture and so that the confucian mm-hmm. classics were taught in all of the schools and it, uh, during pe- certain periods of time other schools of thought were banned there's other factors too that you know led to that and and i think the scope i think just confucius generally speaking is his scope is maybe a little bit broader than what mm-hmm. plato's focus is on too but yeah that's a great question i uh, nobody's asked me that <laughs> uh well let's shift gears and talk about the dao in fact you mentioned daoism and i think daoism is the reason why i've always struggled with this word dao so you explained in your book that in the chinese bible the greek word or yeah, the Greek word logos, as it appears in, for example, the Gospel of John chapter one, is translated as Tao when it's in Chinese, which mm-hmm. I did not know that until I read that. So you're making the same argument that we make about the Greek concept of logos that, you know, like it pops up here and there in philosophy, but ultimately it's a reference to Christ or it's summed up in Christ or fulfilled in Christ or something like that. And so you're saying they're parallel or the same, I guess, in some ways. C.S. Lewis uses the word Tao and abolition of man. And I mean, that, like I said, Taoism is kind of why I found that off putting. And I was kind of suspicious of Lewis. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Not sure what he was doing exactly the first t- a couple of times I read him. So is your use of Tao the same as Lewis? And are you doing the same thing with it in your book? Yes. Well, it's um, so the, the concept of Tao is quite broad in Chinese culture. So Taoism is distinct from Confucianism, but the concept of Tao is also fundamental to Confucianism. Hmm. Taoism is much more, for lack of a better word, religious than uh. Confucianism. And so you you see Taoist temples long before you see Confucian temples. And hmm. you see Confucian temples largely because of the influence of Taoism on Confucianism. Interesting. Um, so Confucianism is, is less a religion. It's not so much religion as a philosophy. Hmm. Taoism, I would classify as a religion. So the Taoists really emphasize the Tao so the Tao is the fundamental principle underlying all reality. And the, the Taoists will emphasize the creative powers of the Tao, like the Tao created everything. Hmm. Whereas Confucianism emphasizes more of the moral nature of the Tao. The Tao hmm. is the way, the way toward which we should all strive. But it, it is also a, a, a force, if you will. But there's just different emphases on the Tao. And so Yes, I'm the way that Lewis uses it in his book. He's thinking of the Tao in more in Confucian terms than in Taoist terms. Hmm. Um, so not as this 
power that this this force that creates everything, this creative power or force, but more of the underlying principle or structure of all reality that gives order to the cosmos. It's the standard by which we must submit ourselves. It's what determines what is right and wrong, what is honorable mm-hmm. and dishonorable. Um, and so this is really in line with confusion. And, and if you look at the, uh, you know, in the, in the appendix to his book, he gives examples of the Tao and different cultures. And like every Chinese reference he gives is from Confucius and the Confucian mm-hmm. tradition. It's not from the Taoist tradition. So yes, when, in my book, I'm mainly thinking of it in terms of um, Confucian ideas, but the scriptures, the New Testament really uses it in both senses. I mean, when mm-hmm. it's talking about all things were created through him, through the Tao, without, you know, without him was not anything made that was made. It sounds much more like a Taoist text mm-hmm. than a Confucian text. And so, yeah, the, the Chinese Bible plays on kind of both, both ideas, but it's a very broad term. Is that an open door for the gospel with Taoists? I mean, are, are you able to bridge that, those concepts together? I, don't, I mean, I could see how with the Greeks, I'm much more familiar with the Greeks. Right. It kind of feels like the concept of the Logos was hanging there, like this fruit that was ripening and waiting for the right time. And I don't know, it just sounds so similar to me. Yes. I mean, it is. It's, I think it's, it is the sort of Chinese Logos. The difficulty with modern Chinese is most Chinese today are atheists. Mm-hmm. And they also look disparagingly on the Chinese classical tradition. It's it's anti-progress and they blame it. They blame Confucianism for a lot of China's problems. And so if you're asking in you know a modern Chinese person, does that serve as a as a helpful bridge? Less so than it used to. Hmm. And in fact, I, I've had some interesting discussions as I've promoted my view of this with Chinese Christians. I find myself sometimes having to first convince them of the wisdom of the, you know, the original <laughs> Taoists <laughs> and the Confucianists. <laughs> like this is a, a just strictly without, without bringing special revelation into this. And, you know, the words that we have, the prophets and all that, just considering natural revelation, which is what Lewis is getting at an abolition of man, trying to get them on board with just seeing the Tao (laughs) and recognizing it and understanding its fundamental importance. Because I I do find that they're probably, generally speaking, more willing to admit the wisdom of their own forefathers than of some Western religion, a foreign religion. And everybody is different, obviously, but Mm -hmm. I sometimes find myself having to first argue for the wisdom of their fathers and then bring in the New Testament and say, and now see all of the things that your forefathers were talking about are fulfilled in the true Tao, who is Christ. Hmm. But it it takes some time to get there sometimes. And and of course, there's other Chinese who uh, it's much easier, but that's an interesting dilemma that a lot of, and that's also one reason that some people are in my circles in China are less eager to jump on board with what I'm arguing is, you know, they say, well, Chinese culture today is more Western than Chinese. And so if we want to prepare people to engage with Chinese culture, then we just need to teach them Western culture. Hmm. My goal is on the one hand, just to bring Chinese Christians closer to their earthly forebears uh, and see God's common grace in that tradition. And then obviously, ultimately, you know, then to help him to see Christ and all of that and see how Christ perfects all of that. So you use the word heaven also. And I mean, I think I kind of figured this out, but for our listeners, for my friend, if you could tell my friend uh, <laughs> to make sure that my friend is right about this. Um, <laughs> so like, for example, on page 125, you say, Chinese classical education, therefore, is not secular education, as many claim. It is rooted in heaven. And then you're quoting something, but I didn't bother to look up the footnote. Sorry. Um, Um, What heaven ordains is called one's nature. To follow one's nature is called the Tao. Cultivating the Tao is called education. I mean, obviously, as an American, I often think of heaven as a place. But I I feel like when you say what heaven ordains, it, it almost feels like you're talking about 
I don't know if it's God the Father or it feels more like a deity than it does a place. <laughs> yes. Okay. And heaven is the, the monotheistic deity Okay. In, in traditional Chinese culture. This is where there's some fuzziness with the Tao and heaven. Uh, so the, you know, again, the Taoists treat the Tao as the ultimate being, if you will. Whereas Confucian is this, that text that you just quoted, what heaven ordains is called one's nature to follow one's nature is called the Tao. Cultivating the Tao is called education. So you can see that the Tao is sort of subservient to heaven. It's the the order that that heaven imposes on the world. But yes, heaven is used interchangeably with Shang Di, which is the emperor on high. Hmm. And so you find both terms being used to refer to the same entity, but, but it, that is God. And again, this there's actually in the New Testament, you find uh, heaven being used in that way. I, I'm trying to remember where it's at. Maybe in Acts somewhere where heaven is, God is referred to as heaven. And, hmm. uh, and so that's the same, that same idea. The, the parallels in different cultures just amaze me because you're saying that they, uh, the other word is the emperor on high, which reminds me so much of the Irish term, which is high king. Hmm. I don't know. It's just interesting how these, we can't escape from these concepts because I'm pretty sure the Irish concept of high king preceded the Christianization of Ireland. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just fascinating. I think that's a that's a really important underlying principle in classical Christian education. Like why why do we study, why don't we just study Christian literature as Christians? Mm-hmm. Like why study these pagan authors? At the root of this, this is all common grace. We do this because we believe that God bestowed grace even on those who didn't know him in a saving way. Mm-hmm. Of course, the New Testament bears witness to all of this. You know, Romans 1, there's a few passages in Acts where even those who have no special revelation, they've not, you know, heard the, the word of God. They still know God. Like Romans 1, the, the condemnation isn't they didn't know God. It's that they knew him, but they didn't worship him and honor him as God. And then their foolish hearts were darkened. Hmm. And so God makes himself known through the Tao or the Tao as Lewis spells it in all cultures and across. And that's, that's really Lewis's his first point, he doesn't just come out swinging and saying Christianity is true. He's trying to put his finger on that common grace that is in all cultures and that all people, regardless of whether they've read the Bible, can they can see the Tao in their culture. And I think that's a really productive way, not just apologetic, uh, you know, an apologetic sort of avenue, but it's also helpful in understanding just the story that God's telling, like, it didn't just start in the Middle East many thousand years ago. Like, as soon as people spread, um, you know, after the flood, they spread throughout the earth. God was telling a story in China long before any missionaries got there. Mm-hmm. And when you realize that and you start reading these pagan classics and you see them talking about, you know, proving that, that heaven is all benevolent. And that heaven is all powerful and that righteousness is submitting to the will of heaven. You start seeing them talk like this without having ever encountered a missionary before. It really mm-hmm. makes you marvel at God <laughs> and to see the work that he's doing there. And then to appreciate more how Christ answers all of their longings and mm-hmm. questions. So yeah, common grace is at the root of classical Christian education. Certainly the classical aspect, I would say. And then we, with the Christian side, that's when God comes down in the flesh and gives us special revelation and we get greater Mm -hmm. clarity. You know, when I was reading the book, I was marveling at how, you know, we talk in classical education circles about this kind of education being about becoming more human Mm -hmm. and pursuing truth and wisdom and to see that same pursuit and really the sa- the parallels in the same concepts of the Western tradition calls virtue. There's a different vocabulary and a different emphasis, but to see two kind of parallel cultures where there's not really interaction in those ancient periods, and yet truth is objective and outside of them, and they're both 
trying to reach it, stretching toward it. Mm -hmm. And that was just, it was just fun to, to see that in the book. Yeah. And it gets, it gets really fun when you start looking at the missionaries, the early missionaries to China, Mm -hmm. when they start to study, you know, see what all these, these sages wrote, they're marveling, like, Mm -hmm. like, wow, they've done all the hard work for us. (laughs) (laughs) uh, And there's just a lot of, I, I, that's probably this this kind of stuff I enjoy the most is reading, you know, early Jesuit missionaries, for example, in the 16th century, like mm. Matteo Ricci, and just seeing how he engages with this classical tradition. It's really exciting. I mean, mm. just to give one example for your listeners, there's a, I think, sixth century literary critic uh, in China called Liu Xie, and he wrote what is the preeminent text on basically literary theory in Chinese history. And he defends literature by tying it to the Tao. And he says, well, let me, uh, actually, I can, I think I can find it here. So I'm looking at page 49 in my book. So for literature, he uses the word when, which is sometimes translated as pattern. Here's what he says. Here's where literature or when came from. Only the human being endowed with a divine spark of consciousness ranks as a third with this pair. And they they were called the, the triad, heaven, earth, and human beings. The human being is the flower of the elements. In fact, the mind of heaven and earth. When mind came into being, language was established. And with the establishment of language, pattern became manifest. Pattern there is when literature became manifest. This is the natural course of things, the Tao. Hmm. And then he goes on and he says, the Tao sent down its pattern through the sages. Uh, It sent down its when, it sent down literature through the sages and the sages made the Tao manifest in their patterns, in their when. And so, first of all, literature, language, and especially the, the writings of men, the reason we have this is because the Tao wants to make itself known, and it does so through the sages. And so everything has its own pattern. So animals have their own when, their own pattern, and the sky has its own pattern. The Chinese word for astronomy is literally the, the pattern of the heavens. Mm. The unique pattern of man is literature. That's this gift of language. And why do we have it? We have it in order to make the Tao known. The Tao wants to be made manifest, and he does so through these sages. And of course, we read that as Christians, and we say, that's exactly right. (laughs) Because that's how God, that is how the Tao, that is how Christ makes himself known to us. Of course, he comes down in the flesh, which is, we can talk about just how crazy that would be to a Chinese person. But he comes to us through, through through his word. He gives us this word through sages who are the apostles. And it's through them that we see the Tao manifest. And so, yeah, this is one example of where you see God laying these foundations before all the missionaries come. And the missionaries come and they're, the ground is all prepared for the gospel. It's just really remarkable. Mm. Well, we've been thinking here about the Tao and how it's parallel with the Greek concept of logos. And as I was reading your book, the one question that came to me, and you did sort of answer it at one part, but I'm hoping I get you to like say a little more. And when I was thinking about like, so what is the difference? Because you definitely convinced me that there is a pursuit of virtue that is going on in that Chinese tradition that is equally noble with what we see in the Western tradition. But we also call our arts the liberal arts. And we talk a lot in Western classical education about how this is the education for a free person. You know, slaves are the ones that receive this utilitarian job-centered education. And then the free man receives an education that fits him for the proper use of his freedom. I mean, you've made the argument that the Chinese don't need, need, they don't need the Western classics because they have their own fathers and mothers that are worth listening to. They should be prioritizing those, their own tradition. And then you bring up the six arts and then the, I think it's the five, the five books. Am I correct? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. Um, so do these six arts and five books, do they have the power to make one free 
the same way that we expect the seven liberal arts to do? That's a great question. Yeah. So, well, first of all, I, I do want to clarify one thing you said, which is, you know, you said they 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 don't need the Western classics. And I would say, I would qualify that and say they don't need the Western classics, but the Western classics are still beneficial to study. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, I, so I'm not arguing for no Western classics. And I, I think there's value. And certainly if we include in that Christian literature, right? That I think they need that. I think they need to be reading, you know, Pilgrim's Progress. Um, mm. They need to read, but I, but I, I make a distinction between Christian literature and Western classical literature. This is an issue of definition of terms. But to get, maybe your, I should have said they don't need Homer. <laughs> <necessarily>. Right? <laughs> yes. Right. Right. They, right. They don't need Homer. And I actually think so. The six arts versus the seven arts. The seven arts, even in the Western tradition, the seven arts are not sufficient for the education of a person. That's one way of categorizing a very specific set of arts. But when you read the, you know, the church fathers promoting education, it's not just study the seven arts and that's enough. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I think I think Ravi Jain, um, Kevin Clark, and Ravi Jain's um, the liberal arts tradition really spells this out well. They summarize the Western tradition as piety, gymnastic, let's see, music, li- liberal arts, philosophy, theology, something like that. Mm-hmm. So there's there's other things that are necessary. The six arts is a, is a different, the organizing principle is a little bit different because they don't, they certainly don't articulate it in the same way that those in the West do. So the, the six arts aren't described as, you know, that which makes a man free or the or the education of a free man. That is a Western idea. And I think it's helpful. So I think the, the principle with the seven arts specifically is the seven arts enable you to learn without a teacher. Hmm. It's these seven arts specifically, if you master them, then you can learn any other material without the aid of a teacher. Mm-hmm. And the Chinese didn't really articulate the six arts in that way. Hmm. The six arts, though, are much broader. If we're just looking for like a a handy little heuristic or a handy little acronym or something, the six arts engages the whole man in a way that the seven arts don't. And in some sense, the seven arts are encapsulated in two of the six arts. And the seven arts sort of exclude four of the six arts. So Mm -hmm. the six arts, are we can kind of think of them in three sections. So you've got rites and music, and these cultivate the affections, the soul, if you will, the heart. And this is very much in line with what Lewis's abolition of man, when we talk about inculcating sentiments, proper Mm -hmm. sentiments that are in line with the Tao. That's the purpose of rites and music. And then script and calculation is essentially cultivating the mind and that's language script is is language study and calculation is math and astronomy things like that hmm. and that's where the kind of the seven arts fit in now i i think there's a, a benefit so i'm a rhetoric teacher and i teach hmm. my students in china western rhetoric hmm. precisely because the chinese tradition did not develop oratory hmm to the degree that uh, the West did. And they developed some categories of rhetoric that I find really helpful. And there are reasons why the Chinese didn't really develop oratory. And so even though we can, you know, consider, you know, language and and math, yeah, we've got language and math in, in seven arts too. They're roughly the same. There are some distinctions that I think are helpful in the Western tradition that I, in my book even, I suggest implementing. And so the six arts, yes, they are sufficient to, the Chinese would say, to raise up a gentleman, not a free man. They would call him a gentleman. I think they are sufficient, but they can be made stronger (laughs) by Mm -hmm. importing some of these um, Western ideas, especially Mm -hmm. with rhetoric and formal logic. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the last two arts in the six arts are archery and charioteering. These cultivate the body and they're, they're martial arts. And of course there's overlap, you know, it also cultivates the heart and mind and, and but primarily the body. And of course the seven arts don't have that. 
And so I don't think the question is which uh, system <laughs> in all these different cultures is the best and then everybody do that system. There are some really fundamental things like I think every culture, no matter where you are, needs to be studying language and yeah. mathematics. Like That's really fundamental to understanding the world. But within that, there's different emphases that one could have. I mean, in the language tradition in, in China, it's very much focused on writing mm-hmm. and includes calligraphy. Calligraphy is very important in the Chinese tradition, not so much important in the Western tradition. And so... You know, does that mean one of them's right and one of them's wrong? I I don't think so. I think God gives different glories to different cultures and we have different gifts. And uh, we can even recognize those just from some common stereotypes of Westerners versus Chinese. And I don't think our goal should be just to create this homogenous human. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the New Testament glories in the cultural and racial differences. I mean, you've got, you know, the same singing in different tongues and different languages. Like Mm -hmm. does God want us all just to speak the same language or different languages? I think different languages because that manifests his glory more. And does he want us all to be wearing the same clothes or different clothes? I think different clothes. I think there's just like a garden has different flowers that uh, with different gifts, if you will. I think that needs to be reflected in our schools, but I think your, your, your question is, Get at something that's important, which is, like, does it actually work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think whatever system you use, it needs to actually work. And yes, right. I think the I think the the Chinese system does, and I think there's compelling arguments for why it does. I think my kids will get behind the charioteering. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, this is way better in baseball. <laughs> I would love to see that. Yes, I would love to. See that. Maybe we can institute that at New St. Andrews College. Have a chair, chair hearing class. I would totally fly out to see that. I was totally jealous of having a, a manners program built in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's interesting too because I I've seen it in you know classical Christian schools. You know they they have protocol or things like that. But that's one of the things, especially when we're talking about abolition of man. I think Lewis makes a good case for the importance of rights education. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when you don't have rights education, you end up with the person that has no chest, like he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Rights Mm -hmm. develops the chest in a way that, you know, many other things can't. So I could see how a homeschool mom, my friend, for example, could read your book and become very fascinated with Confucius. I mean, I'm in California and it is still common for people to travel to Asia and go like find a monastery somewhere and seek enlightenment and read Buddhist things. And that, I mean, like that, like, that's a thing that people still do here. Like it's still 1965 or something. Mm-hmm. And, and so <laughs> I guess I was thinking like, I could see how you made Confucius very attractive what would you say to someone who reads your book and is like, I want to read Confucius, but here's the caveat, hasn't actually, to adopt your language, read her own fathers yet. Like she hasn't read Plato and Homer and, you know, that kind of stuff, but right. she's like, this sounds cool. I mean, what do you, what do you think about that kind of a response when reading your book? <laughs> That's a great question. And I've, uh, it's funny because I've seen that all the time in China. I mean, it's, people get really excited about Plato and Aristotle, and they don't want anything to do with Confucius. <laughs> and and uh, I use this this analogy with them when I discuss this. I say, you know, have you ever gone to a friend's home, maybe growing up or something, and their mom just seems so nice. She's breaking out, you know, the, you know, she bakes, bakes the little pizza pockets or whatever for you. And she's just waiting on you and just seems so wonderful. And, and then you, you know, you tell your friend, man, you have the best mom ever. And your, your friend kind of like rolls his eyes. <laughs> uh, and uh, what's going, what's going on there? Well, you're seeing the mom putting on her Sunday best, you know, mm. for the guest and your friend understands a lot more about mom than you do she he's you know he or she sees his mom on the not so best days and you know what she's like when nobody else is around and 
sees the weaknesses a lot more. Whereas when you're visiting, you just see her putting on the show, uh, you know, or just see, you know, showing you her best. And the same kind of thing happens where when we start really looking at our fathers, we find things that we don't like. <laughs> mm. And we see the, you know, the flashy things that you have know, other, oh, their mom has this thing and their dad has that. And it just seems better because we know our parents much better than those parents over there. And if we were to go over there and live, you know, live in our friend's house for a year, <laughs> we probably would actually find some things about their parents that we would appreciate even more than we originally initially did. But we would also re- start to recognize some of their, you know, not so likable attributes. Mm. And so I think that's just a, that's just a real thing. I wouldn't discourage somebody if an American wants to learn about Chinese culture. I think I think it's great to study. Um, and I should clarify for your listeners that I'm in my book. I'm not suggesting that Western classical Christian schools should, you know, teach all of this stuff. Right. right. I'm talking about Chinese classical Christian schools, and in fact, because of the principles I lay out on this book, I think we need to focus on our fathers, the, the, the heritage of our fathers. Right. But I would encourage you know Western Westerners. You know, we we tend to see the faults of our fathers more clearly than the good things, and mm-hmm. I would I would encourage them. First of all, I would say the faults you see are probably real faults. Like yes, you know, it's like the, yes, your mom is is actually short tempered. You're you're right, but I would encourage them to really develop a robust view of God's common grace and to try and in- intentionally find God's common grace in the tradition of your own fathers. Mm. And it's hard work sometimes. I remember my first time trying to read through Plato's dialogues. I mean, just the the format of it. We're not used to that. Nobody writes books in a dialogue format like that. And it feels stilted and it's just strange. I mean, there's all kinds of things can turn us off (laughs) from, from our fathers. But trying to, again, as a son to a father, as a daughter to a mother, try and submit ourselves. Just submit yourself. You know, the children always think they know better than their parents. And we are prone to the same thing, the same temptations when we look at our ancestors. I would say, give them a chance. Mm -hmm. And if there's something that, you know, you don't understand, your initial sort of gut reaction should be there's something wrong with me, not there's something wrong with them. Like, <laughs> mm, right? There's there's yeah. something I, I lack the knowledge, I lack the ability to understand this well. And so therefore I need to give it more time. I need to make myself better rather than, you know, the reason I can't understand this is because they are just stupid. They don't understand mm-hmm. what they're talking about. And I think all of us who've lived a while. The older we get, we recognize it's the same with our parents too, right? Like things that we just scoffed at when we were children that our parents said or did we thought was stupid. The older we get, we recognize, oh, actually there was wisdom behind all that. Now I get where they were coming from. It's the same thing with our forefathers. And so I would say first comes submission. And again, Lewis gets at this in Abolition of Man. You first submit yourself to the doubt. You first say, all right, I'm going to, even if I don't like it, whatever it is, I'm going to submit myself under it and not bring myself as judge over it first. Before I critique something, I want to make sure I really understand it. And that takes time and maturity. And I think it's also helpful too. something that helps me appreciate my fathers more too, is actually hearing Chinese people talk about the Western, <laughs> the Western fathers. Yeah, that sounds interesting. And hear them admire. It's again, back to my analogy, you have your friend over and all, you, all you've been thinking about, oh, I can't stand it when my mom does this thing and that thing. Oh, can't stand it. And then your mom, your friend comes over and says, man, your mom just is so loving. She, you know, she's uh, always has some wonderful food for me. And you think to yourself, actually, yeah, I guess she, I guess I never haven't really considered that, but she always does, you know, make really good food. It took your friend to point that out to mm. you, your friend visiting. And so you know, if you find out hard, if you're Western or you find out hard to really appreciate Plato, Aristotle and all these guys, like maybe read some people from other cultures who are looking in on your home, if you will, 
<laughs> and admiring this tradition and and it might make you help you to appreciate some of the things you just take for granted. Well, that is a wonderful final thought for us. I appreciate that. Yes. Thank you both for this recording. This was such a great discussion and Brent, we really we appreciate your time and your book, which I keep saying. Mhm. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you guys asking me to to come on and thank you for promoting the book. And uh, I really appreciate all that you're doing here. That's it for today. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of the sisterhood of the podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, share it with a friend and then discuss it with her. This is a great way to continue the conversation. All of the books and things we mentioned today are linked in our show notes. Just go to scolaysisters.com slash SS123 to check it out. Don't forget to sign up for Dead White Guys, Classical Education Meets Critical Theory, our annual spring training featuring Monique Dusson and Krista Bontrager from the Center for Biblical Unity. These two live sessions take place on May 9th and May 16th at 2 p.m. Pacific. For more information or to sign up, go to scolaysisters.info slash CRT. In our next episode, Misty and I spend more time with Renee Shepard, and you are gonna love it. Is there a classical way to teach writing? Yes, there is. Do we have to teach writing the modernist way? No, we don't. Renee is our favorite writing expert, and you are gonna love what she has to say. Until then, we want to remind you once again that homeschooling is a marathon you needn't run alone, so open up your eyes and look around you. Find your sisters. Misty is muted, however. There we go. I had there to prove that it was okay with me that you were recording. And I was like, <laughs> I didn't see the little screen. I'm like, why won't it unmute? <laughs> is it okay if we record a podcast, Misty? <laughs> <laughs> Got it. You're recording. <laughs> Jaeger said we should be sure to include in the bio that Brent was a Chinese TV superstar. <laughs> uh, I think I need the story. <laughs> well, super, no, 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 not, not a superstar. I, uh, oh man. Yeah. So I, I got a, uh, a part-time job as a travel TV show host in China. So basically I would travel around as the sort of clueless foreigner experiencing all these different aspects of Chinese culture. <laughs> and, you know, I would play kind of, yeah, the dumb, the dumb foreigner who doesn't really understand things. And, and I'm learning about Chinese culture. So uh, I did that for, for about a year. We filmed maybe, I don't oh, know, 20 amazing. episodes or so, but uh, yeah, that was a fun it was a it was a really fun, you know, interesting experience. I learned a lot there, but uh a super <laughs> superstar. I love it. Not quite right. <laughs> That's amazing.